Hello and welcome to The Art of Aging, part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. On this show, we look at what it means to age in America and in other places around the world with positive and empowering conversation that challenge, encourage, and inspire all to age with abundance. Today, I am pleased to in, to welcome um, Ashton Applewhite to the podcast. And um, Ashton is author of This Chair Rocks and um, do we say founder, instigator of old school and and I I'm just gonna say old school for right now because things have changed and we'll talk about that in in a couple of minutes. Um so rather than me going into an extensive bio, Ashton, how is it what is your origin story into this space of advocating for age equity and ageism awareness? Uh well, I just, it started in my mid fifties, which is going to be 20 years ago, pretty soon, um, that I just realized this aging thing was happening to me. I was not going to be the only person in the world that didn't get old. And, you know, I don't think that's ageism. I think it's hard to imagine getting old. Like it's when you're a kid, it's hard to imagine wanting to sit still when you could run around. Um, so being nerdy, I started researching longevity and interviewing people over 80 and learned in a just matter of, it was probably months, it felt like minutes, um, that everything I thought I knew about what it was like to be old was flat out wrong or way off base. So I became, and it became obvious really soon also that there were, you know, that we live in a culture that bombards us with negative messages about how awful it's going to be to get old, about how tragic it is to encounter any kind of incapacity. And I started looking at where those messages come from and what purpose they serve. And it was obvious really soon that, you know, ageism bias and stereotypes around aging were the barrier to a more accurate and nuanced understanding of late life. So, um, I got to be in my bonnet about the need to spread the word. So that's what I've been doing ever since. It gets more interesting all the time. Yeah, yeah. So so did you kind of create a job for yourself? Um, well, I had I had a half-time job. I was a writer at the Museum of Natural History here in New York. So that gave me health insurance and a baseline income. So I started a blog, and I laugh now because I would agonize. I write very slowly. I never had no plan to become a writer. I had never thought I'd become a public speaker. I mean, I have never been intentional about any of this stuff. Um, and I would agonize over the post. And I was like, Ashton, literally nobody knows that this blog even exists. So no one is reading it. So just relax. Um, but, you know, I'm very persistent and I just stuck with it. It seemed really interesting to me and it seemed really important to me. A friend asked me, who ran an arts festival, asked me to do an opening monologue. Um, she picks a theme every year, and she picked aging, and all her um, friends said, oh, my God, don't pick aging. No one's going to come. It's so icky and scary. And she tripled her membership because even though we are apprehensive or be be can't, perhaps even because of it, we are hungry to discuss it because we don't. And that... Um, monologue became the basis of my first talk. And, you know, I just, I just stuck with it. And so what came, I, don't, I, I haven't looked at the timeline, what came first? Um, the, so the blog, but then was it this chair rocks or the TED First talk? came the blog, then came um, small, small public speaking um, gigs. I also started a separate blog called Yo Is This Ageist? Yeah. which is modeled on, yo, is this racist with permission, which was, I was talking with a friend about it. And we, we, <laughs> she said the next morning, I was really buzzed. I was really drunk. So I set it up. Um, I set up the account for you. Do you mind? I mean, cause I'm not technically particularly up. They're like, no, thank you for doing that. And so I've been feeding that blog, um, ever since. And then eventually I had written one serious book, uh, writing a book is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it's so, it's honestly, I don't mean to whine, but it's like so hard. So I was like, phew, thank heavens. I never have to do that again. <laughs> but then enough people said, um, you really need to write a book. So I forced myself to write a book. 
And um, all these publishers turned it down. The publisher who had an option, I kid you not, we had like this, I, I thought I got a fancy agent. I thought they're going to give me a bunch of money and this will be easy. And we had a big meeting with the marketing people and the PR people and blah, blah, blah. And the editor said, we're concerned that no one else is writing about this. <laughs> and I managed to croak and I knew it was doomed right there. Uh, but I said, gee, um, not like, are you kidding me? You were in the business of putting ideas into the world, but I think you should see that as a feature, not a bug. But no one else offered me the kind of you know interest that I thought it deserved. So with the help of my partner, who is a pioneer in electronic publishing, we self-published. And after I sold a bunch of copies that way, then um, I was lucky to sell the rights to a new division of Macmillan called Celadon. And they have been just fantastic. Says says no writer ever like years after their book has come out and they continue to support me. I said, it's going to be slow, but it's going to be steady. And at the risk of, of hubris, it's going to become a classic and you are going to be glad you published it. So I think they are. You you can ask them. Yeah, well, it, it is still being published and it's still on the you know top 10 list of folks who are interested in this topic. It, it, it is. It's one of the classics that 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 people need to read. And it's a wonderful that there's more competition now. You know, it really was the first. And now there's a bunch of really good books in this space, which is amazing. So that leads me to my, to my next point. Ashton, you were very generous. You know, my my original contact with you, besides the TED Talk and, you know, this is this ageist and 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 um, and this chair rocks was through Eric Johnson, who was our Del Mar Encore Fellow in 2019. And um, here at the Parker Center, um, we had the opportunity for Eric to come work with us because um, I had been giving um, kind of workshops and I'm like, I'm only one person and I can't, I can't do this myself. Um, how can we put together a curriculum that other people can pick up and use? And so Eric is a filmmaker, so he came to work for us as an Encore Fellow, and he was to put together a couple of videos that would be used for Another Day Older, this curriculum. And, and Eric, he, he went out and he bought um, this chair rocks, and through the Encore Fellow program, we attended a uh, program that Janine Vanderberg um, led, and he, he just jumped into the space. Um, he Once would, you get the bug, you don't yeah. you don't like. Exactly. Because you, you just think it's going to be, it, it just upends all your, it's so unexamined that there are all these fresh, powerful, you know, ideas right, floating right at the top. Exactly. And so he, he, I said, you know, you're the filmmaker, but you, you know, you, you work on this and he reached out to you um, through the old school clearinghouse at the time because you had clips video clips of you talking about some of these things and and I don't remember if we even knew what the purpose of those clips were but he said could I incorporate some of these into this film I'm, I'm doing and you're like yeah sure of course that's and, why I do them yeah but but not everybody would be that generous and and so that's just that that's one of the first things that that I've observed and I continue to observe that um, from- well, thank you. That's nice. I mean, you cannot be in the social movement business, haha, haha, about the business part, <laughs> um, and have a have a proprietary and zero sum mentality. You just can't. Obviously, I like to be acknowledged. Obviously, I also like to be paid for my work. But I would one hundred percent rather have my words go out in the world for free than not go out in the world. And I do always say completely sincerely, if you can pay me, great. If you can attribute me, great. If you can't, if you just want to take my words or I, my ideas and, and they may not fit what you do exactly, repurpose them, adapt them, take them. Not, not everyone, even those who are in, you know, the, the, the world of social movements that are, are as generous as you are. And, oh, thank you. and so that's how, I, that's how I first experienced your generosity. But, um, you know, attending the um, office hours that Old School does every week, and I saw this again recently. Um, so you've been at this work now almost 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> you, 
you are you are deep in it. People are quoting you. And Office Hours is open to anybody who wants to come uh, every Wednesday. And people show up for the first time who have just, their eyes have just been opened to ageism. And, and they come into this Zoom space, as well as I'm sure other conversations and places where you are, and they are so passionate and they have so much energy and they just have to tell everyone what they've learned about ageism. And, and you very generously sit there and you listen and you, you encourage and, um, Listen, it's, it's great. I mean, this is, it's hard. Social change is slow and hard and ageism, you know, as I just said, is pretty unexamined and it can be lonely and you can feel like you are the only person doing this work. And it's really nice to be in the community of other people doing this. I learn things all the time. I mean, I'm an introvert. I spend as much of my time as possible sitting in my room in front of my laptop by myself. And so it's good for me to hear what other people are saying and thinking and to be reminded, you know, that there are a million ways in. And also it's a really valuable sounding board for me. I will say I got this question into yo and I, it's, it's always complicated, right? It's the, the answers are never simple. Like, what do y'all think? Or I, you know, here's what I said. Could I have said it better? So it's, it's valuable to me too. You know, honestly, I'm not being like fake humble here. Well, and, and it, it is such a good model. Um, there, there's Thanks. a, there's a, there's a, I don't know, philosophy called gracious space. And one of the, one of the tenets, principles of gracious, of, of providing gracious spot, space is being willing to learn in public. And that's, that's what you're talking about doing. I, it's funny. Someone said that about me just last night. And I really, it just comes easily to me. I am, you, you know, I am rethinking or refining my ideas all the time. And when I am, you know, lucky enough to have someone to say, eh, you know, I wouldn't say that if I were you. Um, or, or just like refines my point of view. I'm, I'm super grateful. And, and, you know, we, aging is hard in some ways. It's ha so much harder than it has to be because we age in a culture that discriminates and stigmatizes on the basis of age, but we each have to navigate this stuff in our own way. And, and with, and, and so it's really, really useful to be reminded of that and not be preachy. I started out preachier, believe me. Yeah. Well, and the, and the other thing is, you know, I'm always very much aware that when I say things, I'm saying things about later life or, or people who are older than I am based on my relationships with people who are already in those phases and knowing that I haven't experienced that yet. And when I experience that, my experience may, may reveal to me different things and I may have to say, okay, when I said this, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> I was wrong. Um, but I hope that doesn't make you feel ashamed. No. You know? I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, I mean, one of my favorite bits in the book is a phrase, um, is something I learned. I, I went on a journalism fellowship early on and we went to Johns Hopkins and there was a bioethicist who, who gave a talk to us and he said his mantra was a Mexican saying, that the appearance of the bull changes when you enter the ring, right? It looks different to the matador. Yeah, excellent. And I shortened that to the bull looks different. It's what psychologists call the psychologist fallacy, this sort of presumption that we could ever know what another person is experiencing and what matters to them. There's a funny anecdote in the book by a, a, a gyro psychiatrist who worked in a giant old, old people's home in Miami and a woman comes in, she's a million years old and she's been married for almost all those years and her husband has just died and he says, I'm so sorry about your loss. And she said, he was an awful man and I am really happy to be free. And she, even though she was in her nineties, she like had five or six really good years there. So we can't ever know and because we live in this ageist and ableist society, a society that also is terrified about the loss of capacity, physical or cognitive capacity, huge shame and silence around that. So we presume when we see someone who's older or see someone walking with a walker or whatever, we think, ooh, their life must be really hard. It must be devoid of intimacy or comfort or fun or joy. 
Go talk to them with an open mind and find out what their life is really like. The bull looks different. You don't know till you get there. And it's different for one person could experience that same set of circumstances very differently from another person. Exactly. You know, my my grandparents, I think the seven best years of their marriage were the years that they lived in a life plan community. Yeah. Because um, my my grandfather's health was such that he needed to be on a floor with nursing care, mm-hmm. and grandmother was on a floor where she had a, a room kind of in the independent living portion of the building, and my grandfather was um, we could say controlling, <laughs> emotional <laughs> controlling, and 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 she got freed up. Mesu abusive, and she was free exactly. No, no. And, yeah. and she, she would go um, see him every day. But if he was being his Archie Bunker self, she could say, "I gotta go." Yeah, and, it's another. Yeah, sorry, go on. And, and and then leave. And I and I, I just imagine her kind of waving to the nurses at the station on her way down the hallway, it's like he's all yours. Bye, she. <laughs> There's a, another story that reminds me of, I love a story in the book of the other, sort of the other way around of um, a woman whose mom went in, they were, she, her parents lived alone. The husband became increasingly debilitated. He got dementia and they moved into a wonderful um, uh, uh, assisted living nursing home joint outside of New York city. And her mom, and and likewise, he was in um memory care and she lived more independently, but she died after she said, she said her mom got started doing her hair again and her nails again, not because she had been too busy caring for her husband to tend to those things. She didn't have the time and space. So she had, a, she made friends. She had a wonderful, turned out to be the last year of her life. She died. The woman who told the story and her sister came to the nursing home to tell their dad and they weren't sure how much he would understand. As you can imagine, it was incredibly sad. And they noticed as they're at the, you know, by the elevator that there's a group of people there. And the nurse says gently to them, those are his friends. And they are waiting for you to leave so they can be with him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a real community. I mean, I think people are, are weary of moving into assisted living. But the most important component of a good old age is not health. And it's not wealth, it's having a solid social network. And, and you know, these, you know, senior living places provide that in spades. Yeah. So taking a look forward at this movement, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges that are yet, that are, that are coming? Well, I, I think um, a short answer is that, um, most bias is unconscious. You can't challenge ageism or any kind of bias unless you're aware of it and aware of how it lives between your ears. And that's a challenge. People, you know, people don't want to do that. Um, it's uncomfortable. The good news is once you see it in yourself, it is like letting a genie out of a bottle. I see you nodding. You know, then you're like, oh, it's all around me. It's not because I'm a bad person or a lazy person. It is in the structures around us and we can come together and do something about it. So we haven't yet thought about ageism the, or ableism really as much as we have thought about racism and sexism and homophobia. And we need to think about them all. I am not saying one is more important than another. We're not going to undo ageism without addressing racism because so many black and brown people don't get to age at all without addressing sexism because aging is gendered. I already talked about the overlap with ableism. We need to not think of this as a zero sum um, proposition, but we are, I think, very ignorant about ageism. So the first big challenge is to raise awareness of ageism. And it's a pleasure to be able to saying this when just, uh, I think about 10 days ago, last Wednesday was ageism awareness day, which was launched in Australia just four years ago and has already gotten the backing of Help Age International, the American Society on Aging, and is spreading around the world. When we launched Old School, which you've referenced, started as the Old School Clearinghouse, um, you know, my bright idea was, gee, this movement is new. Wouldn't it be great if people could find all the really good resources in one place? And everything is free except the books. We launched in 2018. We didn't even have a campaign section. And now it contains 
over 30. And the first national campaign was Australia's wonderful Every Age Counts campaign. And by the way, anyone can use anything they say or write or print open source. It is all available to anyone who wants to raise awareness of ageism. So is it a big mountain? Hell yes. But are we making all, all kinds of measurable progress, quantifiable progress? Yeah, we are. I'm, you know, I'm very optimistic. Am I remembering correctly that you participated in a webinar with them in Australia? Yeah, yeah, they did an ageism awareness day. And I still, you know, I have a feed, a Google search on ageism, and a disproportionate number of things come from Australia because they sowed the seed with this campaign. Exactly, exactly. And I think that um, this is perhaps one of the um, benefits of the pandemic that um, technology allows us a little bit more glow to have these conversations a little bit more Agreed. Um, than we were doing even five years ago. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, another, it's hard to call it a benefit, but you know, the conversation around the age of presidential candidates has been hideously ageist and ableist, but it has raised awareness of ageism. And a lot of the, you know, from across the political spectrum, people are saying, they may say, I know this is ageist, but those old coots should shuffle off. The I know this is ageist, but is huge progress. Yeah, true, true, true. So do you want to talk a little bit about the, the rebranding and then it's no longer called a clearinghouse? Sure. I'll, I'll talk about it briefly, but I, and on, but honestly, then I would much more interested in hearing what it means to you as someone on the outside. We started, in fact, partly catalyzed by the pandemic to bring people together because we could virtually, we, we hosted um, movement gather movement builders convenings and and workshops and stuff and then we started to host this Wednesday Zoom open to all it's called office hours and all this is available really easy to find at oldschool.info and we realized like the movement building means bringing people together so we decided to turn into um, change from clearinghouse which no one knows what it means anyway um, but sort of this repository to the old school hub for age equity and ageism awareness, to develop more ways to bring people together and to become a place where people can't, if, who are working to end ageism um, can list their projects and find people to support and inform that project. So a group is in the process of emerging that will help us do that because we, we are few and we are not rich. So hopefully that will emerge as the hub develops. Absolutely. And, and, um, you know, in full disclosure, I was able to, uh, really glad I was able to participate in your summer school this past year. Yes, we left that out. We, we brought people together for the first time in person at something we called summer school in Montreal last August. And we had a waiting list. I mean, I, I had no idea whether anyone would show up. Um, but 40, uh, people, just the first 40 who said yes, um, to come together and spend two and a half to get days together to envision a world without ageism. And it was an attendee-led convening. I don't know about you, Beth. I was a total virgin. I had no idea what that meant. My two colleagues had experienced and facilitated the structure, which has a very clear structure and outline. But what happens in each session depends entirely on what the people there decide they want to talk about and what over and and what things over a very structured process of reiteration and refinement what we decide collectively is important to us on the projects page of the old school hub are 10 guiding questions that we want people who submit things to the hub to consider. Can you answer yes to these questions? And they make me really happy because I didn't cook them up. They emerged. They were the distillation of everything that, I mean, I'll let you finish the sentence, you know, everything that these really smart, interesting, committed people arrived at. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you would have asked, I think, any of us if, when we first gathered what we thought would be the outcome, um, I really was skeptical that anything as clear as those 10 questions. <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> and, and I think they're really helpful questions. And I just I encourage they're beautiful and powerful. Yep. Yep. And 
and I, 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 I go back and look at them on, on occasion, and, and in my own mind, I'm kind of, okay, how can we use those here at the Parker Center um, as, as we move forward? Because I just, I, I think they're really helpful. Um, That's great. And I, and we're also thinking about, you know, with the help of the Hubsters, this group that is emerging, how to, um, how to, how to frame them in the context of one question that is overarching, but doesn't appear and probably needs to, which is who is missing? Yeah. Are these projects also helping, you know, people from communities that are underrepresented in age adequate uh, advocacy, which is mostly made up of wait for it, people who look like you and me, right? You know, older middle-class white women, which, and we, we, you know, we're driving this thing, but you cannot retrofit inclusion. We have to build it in. Exactly. exactly. And it's hard and it's slow exactly. and it's clumsy. Yeah. So what is it that gives you the most energy at this point in this uh, <laughs> long process. I, I know that with the National Center for Reframe Aging, they say it's going to take a generation. Um, and, you know, who to knows what? here's a generation. Is. What's going to happen when my kid is my age? I mean, exactly. I think those kind of finite yeah. statements are silly. Yeah. But, but not like it's a long haul. Was yeah, it's a long haul. It's a long haul. I mean, it's funny because exactly what is giving me energy is what is currently all kind of exhausting me. I have a lot of energy. I have been working full time on this since August and I am tired and I don't like being this tired and I don't like working this hard. I like working really hard, but not all day, every day. So, but you can see from how I talking, this is the work I want to be doing with at the risk of sounding pretentious with that equity lens, right? That's the hardest part. It's the most uncomfortable part. I am not interested in building a movement of old white ladies. Right. Uh, we, and old school is committed to trying to help inform and create and support a movement for age equity that represents us all. Everyone is aging. How do we do something that lifts all the boats and that encourages people to support all these other struggles for equity, right? right. So that is 100,000% the work I want to be doing. And I'm excited by it. I am I need to step back a little bit and let the, you know, I don't know how to run a meeting. I don't know how to facilitate my way out of a paper bag. I don't know how to manage anyone and I don't want to learn. But luckily, some of the people who came to summer school do know. And my colleague Ryan is really good at this. And that will emerge, I think. If it doesn't, then it isn't meant to be. I mean, one of the liberating things about liberating structures was I'm not the boss of it. And thank God for that, because I truly don't want to be. And I know you know I'm not fake saying that, right. but that was really, really, it's like, it's, we're going to figure this out. And if it takes a really, really long time, it takes a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the first question kind of gets to what, you know, what you're talking about and just is, is this necessary for some and good for all? And, and, and who are the some you're saying, who are those some people? Right. Does it in good for all, you know, is it helping people with less economic right. and social status? I mean, one of the tough things that I learned, you know, I'm learning all this stuff and I, I, I certainly identify as a feminist and have for decades, but I had no idea. I did, would have thought that if it's good for white women, it's good for all women. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's not the case. And that was a really you know, a hard thing to think about. And I'm still working on understanding it. If it's good for old white, old, old, well-off people, I should make it about class really more than race. So I, I, I walk that back a little bit, but what is it doing for people who don't have the time and energy or a half-time job at the museum of natural history, right? right? So they can afford to spend the time that I could, how are those of us with more time, more energy, more money, making sure that it is necessary for some and good for all, that it doesn't come at anyone else's expense. Well, and again, I think this is part of your generosity. Um, I, I think the best that we can do is how do we help to create the space for, for voices who aren't heard 
that they can come into the into the, the midst of that space and that their voices can be heard and 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 trusted and helped. So I really I urge anyone who is listening to this, please look look around the room and think who is missing. You know, is everyone in the room the same age? You know, that's that was my biggest takeaway from summer school was the need to reach out more to younger advocates. But cultivate, reach out. It's awkward. It feels weird. But to people who don't look like you and say, let's have lunch. Right. You know, say, let's have a phone conversation. Say, what, what's, what are you working on? And how can I support you on your terms without expecting anything back? Right. And, and be there for them. And that's how an authentic relationship forms. And then you can build on that. Right. 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 Well, Ashton, we're just so appreciative of you giving your time um, for this podcast, this conversation today. Um, it is uh, really a joy and a privilege to be able to to work with you and to to see and use the hub um, as we're Thank helping you. now and, and going forward. Um, and and now for the part that um, I, I don't think you're looking forward to, but our <laughs> final three questions that we ask everyone. Are you ready? Sure. They, don't, they don't have to be profound questions, profound answers. <laughs> good. And, uh, I can, you know, later tell you some of the, the, the more memorable answers that some folks that you know have given us. Um, but first question, when you think about how you've aged, what do you think has changed about you or grown with you that you really like about yourself? Um, I think I know myself better and am more confident for sure. I bet everyone says that. I bet every person. Um, I, and better at figuring out what I want to do and what I don't. Uh, I, I, I heard that as you're talking about, you know, what you're doing and, and, you know, I, I admire your clear setting of knowing your skills and, and what you have the energy to do and, and, and using those boundaries to welcome other people in with different sets of skills to, to be able to participate. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question number two. See, see, you do, you are reflective about these things. Um, what has surprised you most about you as you've aged? That my hair hasn't gone gray. Ah. It's kind of ironic. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, but if, if, if anyone could use gray hair, it would be me. <laughs> Do you have people question you? If you're oh, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, did you believe Ronald Reagan when he said he didn't dye his hair? I didn't. <laughs> But I also don't want, I, 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 I feel really strongly, having brought up my appearance, that it's really important not to talk about appearance, especially for women. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, last question. Is there someone that you've met or who's been in your life that has set a good example for you in aging? Someone that inspires you to what we call age abundantly? Um. Well, I met two people early on. I met, I'm looking um, up at a, uh, a photograph of him. I was lucky enough to meet Robert Butler. Look at what ah, a lovely face yeah. he has. Yeah. He, um, he invented the term ageism. Mm -hmm. And he started something called the International Longevity Center here in New York. He's kind of my ga guiding angel here. Um, and... I was really lucky to meet him. He was really generous to me when I had that blog with like four readers and I applied to do, um, you know, a, a fellowship with them. And then he's like, sure, which was, you know, fantastic. And, um, and he gave me some very subtle course corrections that were very useful to me. I was at the time interviewing people who worked, which meant paid employment. And he said, you know, if you get up in the morning, you're aging productively. And I, have, I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it was important. And then I figured out over years what it meant. And another person who influenced me a lot, her book really, um, uh, really radicalized me was an age scholar named Margaret Morgan Roth Gallette. She's just, she writes a book every five minutes. So I hate her for that. Um, her latest is just coming out. It's called American Elder Side. And it's about the preventable death of so many older people during the COVID pandemic. But um, I just, I did this like pilgrimage to her house, her book called Age Wise. 
And she has another great book called Age by Culture. And it just made me, it was the thing that made me look at the structures and systems that frame our aging. And I, I made a little pilgrimage to her house. She has a lovely house outside uh, in Brookline, Massachusetts. I didn't know, I think about it now, you know, I didn't know what I was asking. She couldn't help me. It, she couldn't help me like figure out what I wanted to do with this. Right. Um, she was just, she was just gentle and nice and supportive. I mean, she's fierce also, but um, so she was another person who really helped set me on my path. Excellent, excellent. Well, again, thank you. And thank you to our listeners for um, this episode of The Art of Aging, part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. And we want to hear from you. What's changed most about you if, as you have aged? What has surprised you most? And how do you define abundant aging? And who is your abundant aging influencer? Um, you um, can visit us at www.abundantagingpodcast.com to share your ideas. You can also give us feedback when you visit the Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging website at www.unitedchurchhomes, all one word, dot org backslash Parker hyphen center. And, and um, again, thank you and, and be on the lookout. Ashton does not sit um, in one place for very long and and it can be heard on all kinds of webinars and podcasts and um, speaking engagements um, near you if not just by your computer I think Ashton my my observation is now that ageism awareness day is becoming a little bit more um, known and that it's being centered on October 9th I think September and October are going to become the two heaviest months for folks for base. From your lips to God's ears. And you're clearly the people to be saying that to. <laughs> in, terms, in terms of speaking engagements and, and all other kinds of opportunities. But my uh, website is thischairrocks.com, which links to all these other things. The book, to, Yo Is This A, just my appearances calendar. So I'm, I'm easy to find. And please check out the Old School Hub um, the new logo. I, I loved your description of, of the logo. Do you want to just briefly give your synopsis of what it means to you? No, you tell it. Um, well, it's an O and an S, and in the middle of the O, um, there's a square, so um, it kind of looks like a bolt. Yeah. Then, yeah? Yeah. And, and um, but the O, and then the way the S, the font of the S is there, it almost looks like a snail. And, <laughs> and so... The symbolic of the fact that this is slow work um, and and that we're trying to um, make it stick. Um, You're trying to build something. Yeah, trying to build something using yeah. the nuts and bolts that, that are needed for social movements. So. Yeah, I like that. Uh, oldschool.info, same URL. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you to all you that all you do, and for being um, a, a generous in, inspirer of of many of us. Um, literally, so thanks for having me. Yep, thanks, Ashton. Bye. 